Good afternoon. Let me begin by saying how privileged I feel to eventually be at the LSTC, of which I've heard so much uh, during uh, several, several years by encounters with church leaders, with colleagues who had been here. And for me now to be at the LSTC, to get to know the staff, to get to know the teachers, to get to know the facilities, is indeed a very special moment, which I will treasure uh, as I then continue my travel, as you mentioned. I feel very privileged to have been given the opportunity to speak to you about the report from Conflict to Communion, which was developed by the International Lutheran Catholic Study Commission on Unity, and which was presented in 2013 to the Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation, LWF. While the LWF received the report for further use within the communion, the Catholic Church processed a similar recommendation through its own structures. This eventually led to the unprecedented step of presenting the report in the form of a joint letter signed both by the Pontifical Council for the Promotion of Christian Unity and the Lutheran World Federation, which was then sent to their respective constituencies. From Conflict to Communion is one of the documents in the LWF whose reception required neither much promotion nor a proactive process design. In fact, this report has taken on a life of its own. We rejoice today at self-initiated translations into several languages, such as Japanese, Portuguese, and Polish, for instance. Moreover, it has been most rewarding to see how local bilateral structures between Catholics and Lutherans have taken it up, agreeing on public discussions, study processes, or as it has been the case here in the United States, developing a study guide to assist congregations and groups to process and to discuss this report. All of this shows that the report from conflict to communion meets, meets a need, a real need, which I interpret as being the LWF member church's desire for assistance so that their approach to the Reformation anniversary, that, uh, the 500th anniversary, Reformation anniversary, takes into account the ecumenical dimensions of that commemoration. 2017 is not 1517, also in view of ecumenical relations. But how to translate this into our approaches, into the emphasis and directions that would shape the anniversary's commemoration? How can we make sure that we get it right in 2017? These questions, they were addressed by an international working group appointed by the LWF. And a close look at previous centennial celebrations revealed that these had not always been helpful, not only with regard to ecumenical relations, but also to the specific theological features they had promoted. Therefore, a thorough analysis of context was undertaken on the basis of which the group identified the key features that are to guide the approach to the Reformation anniversary. Let me explain these three directions, approaches, pledges, as I want to call them, which the LWF wants to hold firm as we approach the 500 years of Reformation. The first of these pledges. At this juncture, five centuries after the beginning of the Reformation in Wittenberg, the LWF wants to underline the global nature of Reformation. The statement, Reformation is a global citizen, affirms that Reformation has moved beyond its historic places, notably the North Atlantic realm, 
and has taken root all over the world. This, in turn, calls for an intentional approach to ensure that the global nature of reformation, including its diversity and the distinct identities that have emerged, are brought into the picture and, more importantly, into dialogue with one another. Today, the LWF is a polycentric communion, and this polycentricism needs to be emphasized in 2017. The choice of Wintook, Namibia, as the venue for the 12th Assembly in 2017 is a deliberate attempt to express this new stage in the evolution of Lutheran Reformation as a global citizen. Our second pledge. At this juncture, five centuries after the beginning of the Reformation in Wittenberg, the LWF wants to emphasize the ongoing Reformation with the motto of not only churches of the Reformation, but churches in ongoing reform, the LWF captures this forward-looking approach. We will focus on the ongoing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how it continues to call people and churches into transformation and witness. The LWF's choice to invest in a global movement of the young reformers, as we call them, more than 1,000 young people interacting globally together on questions of being the church in the world today is an example of this approach of churches in ongoing reform. Emphasizing the ongoing character of reformation does not imply that the LWF is trapped in the prevailing mood of immediacy and short-term memory, which unfortunately also affects our churches. Rather, our hope is to avoid getting stuck in history, while indeed being aware of our history of five centuries. This leads me then to the third principle, or the third pledge, we want to observe as we approach the Reformation anniversary. We are very committed to approach this Reformation with a sense of ecumenical accountability. What do we mean here? Generally speaking, it is about what I want to refer to as a multiple mindfulness. First, the history of Lutheran churches does not begin in 1517. Lutherans do and should look at a much larger time span which originates in the power of the Spirit that moved the apostles to witness and communion relations. There is a common history of almost 2,000 years while we approach the 500th anniversary. This needs to be brought into the picture. Secondly, the LWF wants to be mindful of the fact that the Reformation legacy has also influenced the thinking and the teaching of other denominations, and that in terms of their theological identity, specific Reformation insights are owned by many of them up to the Pentecostal churches today. Theological features of Lutheran Reformation, therefore, are not an exclusive property of Lutheran churches. Thirdly, the LWF wants to be mindful of the fact that the year 2017 does not only mark the 500th anniversary of Reformation, but also the 50th anniversary of international ecumenical dialogues between LWF and the Catholic Church. Therefore, an affirmative action is required so that these 50 years are not overlooked, pushed aside, or sidelined during the commemoration of five centuries of Reformation. But more specifically, the pledge to ecumenical accountability includes the intentional affirmation 
of the many fruits that the bilateral ecumenical dialogues have borne over the last few decades. Two processes are particularly significant in this respect, which I want to highlight here. In the year 2010, the LWF recognized the need to come before the Mennonites in order to apologize for the fact that Lutherans had misrepresented Anabaptists and had tolerated, if not instigated, violence against them. It would be so wrong if our desire to reconnect with Reformation insights of the 16th century were to lead us to reconnect to past misrepresentations which we have recognized as having been wrong and if we would forget about past violence for which we have apologized and have received forgiveness. The commemoration of the 500th anniversary must not undo the past ecumenical achievements, but rather bring these into the narrative of the Lutheran churches as they commemorate 500 years and prepare themselves to undertake their next steps into the future. This is particularly true for another process directly related to the report from Conflict to Communion, the milestone in the International Lutheran Catholic Dialogue the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, JDDJ as we call it, solemnly signed by the LWF and the Roman Catholic Church in 1999. These two landmarks, the Mennonite Action and the JDDJ, are the two key inspirations for the report from conflict to communion. It might take my audience by surprise that the Mennonite action is one of the midwives of From Conflict to Communion, a dialogue report between Catholics and Lutherans. But this is true. Actually, right after the Mennonite action to which I was referring in 2010 at the LWF assembly in Stuttgart, Germany, while walking out of the plenary hall, hall the then president of the Pontifical Council to promote Christian unity commented, we must do something similar in 2017. And this was then the starting point for continued joint discussions and for tasking the Lutheran Catholic Study Commission on Unity to produce the theological foundation for a common approach to Reformation anniversary. And the Mennonite action characterized by its focus on reconciliation, constituted the decisive paradigm for Lutherans and Catholics to approach the anniversary and invited the two of us to move away from a situation of confrontation and conflict and move towards reconciliation and growing communion. I wish to underline that the second turning point the JDDJ, the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, is crucial for the theological architecture of the report from conflict to communion. Since from conflict to communion builds directly on the differentiated consensus that was reached in 1999 with the Joint Declaration. In terms of theological coherence, Producing from conflict to communion was only possible because a theological foundation was laid with the JDDJ that provided for a basis for this intended transition from a situation of conflict towards a situation of deeper communion. This aspect is vital since it locates from conflict to communion in an ecumenical continuum and responds to the question sometimes raised by other, mainly European Protestant churches, why the LWF moved ahead with the report bilaterally without involving other Protestant denominations in the process. The response to this valid question has both a formal and a theological side. The formal side 
is that the LWF is not mandated to speak on behalf of other denominations. Less so, since several of them would not be able to adhere to the consents outlined in the JDDJ. Hence, not only would the LWF have exceeded its mandate by speaking on behalf of others, but in addition, it would have imposed on others an agreement that constitutes the theological axis of from conflict to communion. Allow me now a brief discretion at this point and refer to a question that understandably keeps arising. Where do these old dialogues lead us? Will they be the way to unity, the unity we pray and we work for? Lately, I have come to understand that the results of dialogues, their findings and breakthroughs, cannot be fully grasped if one looks at the short term only. I hope that my exposition thus far has demonstrated that assessing the results and impact of the dialogues, and therefore their contribution to the unity in the body of Christ, requires an approach that takes also the medium and the long term into consideration. From conflict to communion testifies to ecumenical patience and long-term vision. Inspired by the Mennonite action and building on the achievement of the JDDJ, the Joint Declaration, from conflict to communion reminds us how the dialogues and their results have often, like cascades, flown into pools of crisp and fresh water, and like meandering streams, turning the at times arid lands of interchurch relations into fertile green pastures. The quest for unity requires patience, long term vision, and sustained efforts, as well as the recognition that it is never winter simultaneously in all parts of the world. Therefore, the talk about the ecumenical winter will never make sense to us in the LWF. Because of our global constituency, we know only too well that while always active, God's spirit works in different ways in different parts of this world. Instead of winter, I would suggest that we speak of an overall change in the climate of ecumenical dialogues and the shifting paradigms of it and how this change is one of the key challenges to the ecumenical movement today, including our bilateral dialogues. I intend to elaborate on this aspect at the end of my presentation. But now to the from conflict to communion. The methodological approach of from conflict to communion the joint retelling of a shared history is one that has been supported many times by churches all over the world when communities and societies were attempting to overcome trauma, division, and clouded memories. However, this methodology has not been, the churches have not been too keen to apply this methodology to their own traumatic experience of rapture, violence, and division. Healing of memories can only begin when history is told, assessed, and jointly understood. This is the unique contribution of the Lutheran Mennonite dialogue, which resorted to this methodology of shared story, history telling, when clouded memories were obstructing fruitful theological discussion. Therefore, from conflict to communion is the first attempt of Catholics and Lutherans together to tell the story and the history of Reformation at an international level. This is done very sensitively throughout the report, which identifies the theological issues that became a matter of dispute during the 16th century and traces the developments since then. The report looks 
at the theological developments within our two world communions and the, and the ecumenical dialogues over the last 50 years. It singles out those differences between Lutherans and Catholics which, because of certain theological and ecumenical developments, should today be considered as having been overcome, as well as those differences that remain despite, despite these developments. The report concludes with five ecumenical imperatives or guiding principles that are to be observed in further ecumenical interaction and dialogue. What the report does not do is to locate these theological issues into which it dwells within the wider context of the political, economic, and social developments of the 16th century. For good reasons, the report does not go into this wider analysis, which would have required considerably more work and given it a totally different focus. History tells us, however, that there were many more issues at stake during the 16th century, and that change was in the air in the Central European political, economic, and social realms. The Reformation became both a catalyst and an impulse for profound change, as well as an instrument, if not an instrumentalized movement at a time when strong hegemonic powers were contesting for political and economic interests in a changing world. I believe it is very important to emphasize this aspect. The Lutheran Reformation cannot be exclusively seen as a dispute around theological ideas. This rather idealistic understanding would fall short of explaining the power of the Reformation movement, let alone the brutal, unjustifiable violence of the so-called religious wars that followed. Looking at the Reformation from this broader perspective reminds us that religion has always had the ambivalent potential of being both a catalyst for astonishing transformation as well as an instrument of oppression and violence. This helps us to be more self-critical, which is very much in line with the commitment to an ongoing reformation and prevents us from triumphalist approaches towards the reformation anniversary. An anniversary commemoration without a deep lamentation over ruptures in the body of Christ in communities and families, and without the confession of an alignment to political interests, would be a historic mistake. Moreover, this wider perspective also helps us not to look at confrontations within other religious communities today with a sense of superiority, nor to misunderstand their true nature they are not very different from the religious war that almost halved the population of Central Europe in the century following the Reformation. They too are an expression of a much larger political, cultural and economic dispute over claims to power which have managed to align religious factions to their respective interests. This then leads me to sharing with you my deep hope that this report, and above all, what we will do with it, will speak powerfully to a world that seems to be overshadowed by fragmentation, withdrawal, regression, and communication breakdowns. Globalization, with its pretension to bring us Eve ever closer together, instead seems to be driving nations, communities, religions, global Christian communions, ethnic groups apart. It appears to be safer to seek refuge in small isolated islands of identity than to face the challenging reality of complex diversity. 
it seems to be easier to resort to aggressive interaction rather than to cooperative collaboration. As Bishop Medardo Gomez of the Lutheran Church in El Salvador stated recently, once again, it looks as if it is safer to be engaged in violence than to be engaged in peace efforts. Yet at the same time, I sense a deep longing among people around the world as they look to the hills with the Psalm 121 for signs of hope, for signs of encouragement in the search for alternative ways of sharing our common humanity and our common planet. These approaches would not operate on the basis of differentiation and exclusion, but on the ethos of inclusion and interdependence, if not mutuality. Is it too presumptuous to think that the strong message of moving from conflict to communion might speak to the longing of these people? Is it overly enthusiastic to think that the commitment of Catholics and Lutherans intentionally to leave conflict behind in order to continue journeying into deeper relations of communion might offer a powerful vision, a hope, an encouragement to people otherwise witnessing breakdown and violence? I believe the ecumenical endeavor in general and from conflict to communion in particular to have a prophetic message today. No, we are not comfortable with giving in to fragmentation and to segregation. Yes, we know that the centrifugal forces that drive us apart are countered by the centripetal force of baptism that calls us together into unity and joint witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, we do not ignore that baptismal call into unity that always calls us out of our comfort zones. And yes, we see unity ahead of us because we see our ecumenical undertakings against the horizon of their fulfillment because of what God does. Why would from conflict to communion not carry this powerful message even to people outside the church. For this to happen, though, Lutherans and Catholics need to overcome a methodological shortcoming in the ecumenical movement that tends to think that with the publication of a report, realities have been changed. It takes more, which is why clear reception processes need to be designed. As mentioned at the beginning, part of this has happened already. But besides these issues, we are envisaging at a global level two specific steps to bring from conflict to communion into reality. The first one is the production of a sample structure for a common prayer that the Vatican, the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, and the LWF will provide for the LWF and Catholic dioceses in a joint letter. This common prayer service, which is currently being finalized, builds on from conflict to communion in respect to its theological insights and particularly its internal structure. Accordingly, the common prayer will move from joy over the gospel, over the gifts of the Reformation and the 50 years of ecumenical dialogues, to lamentation over ruptures, misrepresentations, discrimination, exclusion, and violence. From there, it will convey the common vision of unity and through the five ecumenical imperatives, commit to the common witness to a wounded and fragmented world. It is my deep hope that this common prayer in its local adaptations will be widely used and together with our Catholic neighbors. I'm sure it has the potential emphatically to convey that a counter proposal is being offered to the prevailing paradigm which I have characterized above as that transition from cooperation into fragmentation. 
The second activity we are planning is a joint ecumenical event that will take place October 31, 2016, in the city of Lund, Sweden, the birthplace of the Lutheran World Federation. The LWF has invited the Vatican, the PCPCU, the Pontifical Council to promote Christian unity to prepare this global event jointly. With this event, it is hoped to send a powerful ecumenical signal both to Catholics and Lutherans around the world to approach the last 12 months until the anniversary in 2017 in a spirit of mutual ecumenical respect and accountability. Detailed final discussion are currently taking place and the event on the event and in its shape. I have twice now referred to what I call ecumenical patience and perseverance by pointing to the long-term perspective that is required when engaged in ecumenical processes. Let me now offer the dialectic counterweight to that notion because as there must be ecumenical patience and perseverance, I believe we need also what I call ecumenical impatience, without which the risk of stagnation of ecumenical process would be high. In light of the strong affirmation and political backing that is offered to from conflict to communion, we must recognize and acknowledge that many baptized on the ground, those faithfully attending worship, serving the poor and speaking out for justice in the name of Christ, want to see much more in 2017 than what is currently in offer. In concrete terms, our message of turning the page and moving from conflict to opening the chapter of deeper communion everything that we offer as a joint witness in our broken world will inevitably have to be found there where it is expressed in the deepest and most intimate ways, at the table of the Lord, the Holy Communion. Indeed, many people no longer understand or are questioning why the reasons given for not being able to share communion are reasons enough to prevent us today from sharing at the table of the Lord. There is a holy, prophetic impatience out there for which, despite the fact that it challenges us, I personally feel deeply grateful. Let me connect this pressure to what I referred earlier as the overall changing climate in ecumenical relations and what these changes imply in view of our ecumenical agendas, methodologies, and processes. I will do so by referring to my personal experience as a pastor back in my home country in Chile. It is a story I have shared elsewhere, since it conveys in powerful ways the, 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 what the, to the questions I raised here. I will tell you about the way in which we, back home in Chile, used to celebrate Holy Communion in an extremely poor neighborhood. The moment of sharing the peace before communion seemed to be never ending. Everyone had to be greeted, embraced, and to receive the, the peace. Members of the congregation stood around in groups and told each other stories about their week, often even laughing mischievously, winking at one another. As the pastor, I frequently had to remind the community discreetly that the sharing of that peace is actually one step towards communion. But I soon understood that for these people, lastingly marked by daily exclusion and marginalization, holy communion had become a festival of inclusion a tangible message of God's unconditional acceptance and of the overcoming of structures of marginalizations under which they were suffering. Naturally then, everyone needed to be greeted. Nobody 
could be left out. People who had to struggle for every tiny thing in their lives intuitively grasped the immeasurable gift received in Holy Communion and were so eager to be part of that. The group of the damned of the earth, earth became at the same time the community of those accepted and included by God in Holy Communion, which became the key place to receive and to claim this new sense of citizenship in the world. Well, I ask myself, have they not grasped something that is at the core of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And hence, would they not understand unity on the basis of a totally different paradigm? Would there be anything wrong with including others in this festival of inclusion into which God calls God's broken world, they would ask? Where, other than on the side of this powerful tide that breaks barriers and overcomes exclusion, can the church stand? This tide initiated by God's incarnation in Christ and in which the church is caught continues to push into our world. Does the church participate in this mission or what exactly is its mission then? The reason for bringing this provocation at the end of my presentation is to reflect on the epistemological and hermeneutical assumptions on which our ecumenical processes are rooted, and to think of new paradigms as providing a great chance and opportunity for the global ecumenical movement to make significant steps forward. The Sunday morning episode in Chile raises a whole set of different questions and perspectives to look into the same old challenge. How do we receive the gift of unity? And it makes a considerable difference whether one reflects on unity out of a situation of vulnerability and exclusion, both individually and institutionally. The cross of Christ, which all churches hold in common as a graphic symbol of their belief, is at the same time the deepest expression of such vulnerability and exclusion. Why not then move further in ecumenical dialogues by allowing the hermeneutics of the cross to shape agendas, methodologies, participant lists? What steps towards unity would be offered if prayed for, sought after, and worked towards among persecuted Christians today? What if they would be asked to drive the ecumenical processes and shape its agendas. I'm coming to an end. From conflict to communion does not stand in contradiction to what might be the future of ecumenical undertakings if we were to undertake them out of an acknowledgement of our vulnerabilities. On the contrary, from conflict to communion takes us important steps further towards the unity that lies ahead of us, because it includes in its texts the vulnerability of shared storytelling, the vulnerability of recognition of mistakes, and it refers to the transformation Lutherans and Catholics have undergone since then. It provides the basis for a liturgical proposal that will include words of repentance for what Lutherans and Catholics have done, not only to one another, but also for what they have allowed to be done, if not even done themselves, to people in the world, God's beloved daughters and sons. From conflict to communion holds fast to unity in times of fragmentation. In this regard, I am deeply grateful for this document. It is an expression of both ecumenical perseverance and patience, as well as the prophetic impatience that invites us to take new promising steps. I truly believe 
that from conflict to communion is merely beginning to unfold its power and potential. Others will tell that story later, hopefully. But it is for us now to bring this report to life and thereby to undertake the daring, the prophetic step of letting conflict go so that our hands, our minds, and our hearts are empty enough to receive communion as God's gift. Thank you very much. Steve and I were talking beforehand, and I, I realized that the last time I stood at this podium, when there was an entirely different room around it, was probably in 1993 at the World Mission Institute when I gave the keynote, and Steve introduced me then, too. So at any rate, so it's a homecoming that way. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to respond to Reverend Dr. Martin uh, Junge's paper, uh, From Conflict to Communion, A Prophetic Witness in a Fragmented World, at this 2015 Scherer Lecture. I believe that this event will make a constructive contribution to the upcoming anniversary of the 16th century reformations, which we will commemorate in 2017. It's my hope that the commemorations will focus on the beginning of a process which validates the 20th century ecumenical movement and not in a call for repristination in our separate communions. As my small contribution to that goal, I want to offer a doctrinal analysis, a reflection on the current state of our Lutheran Roman Catholic relationship and on one of the key ideas necessary to achieve the goal of a positive commemoration of the Reformation. There are a number of things in the late 20th century that could vie for the title most significant ecumenical event. One could name the common Christological declarations between the Catholic Church and the Assyrian Church of the East, the Armenian Apostolic Church, the Coptic Orthodox Church, or one could name the full communion agreements between the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and the Episcopal Church and the Reformed Churches. But any list one might make must include the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification between the Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation. I appreciated very much hearing that Dr. Junge considered the JDDJ as a crucial foundation for the theological architecture of the report from conflict to communion, and essential for the theological coherence of an ecumenical approach to the anniversary of 2017. So in service of that insight, I want to focus my response on the JDDJ and a particular American theological analysis of it. I previously gave you a list of some of my candidates for most significant ecumenical event of the 20th century. My own selection actually doesn't include any of the things on that list. I would propose rather the not so subtle shift in theological methodology which became the condition of the possibility of each of the events I just mentioned. To describe that shift, I want to share with you the theological reflection of one of America's greatest Catholic theologians, Avery Cardinal Dulles, who was originally quite critical of the JDDJ, but later came around to a basically positive assessment. His shift in position was a result of the recognition of the shift in theological methodology. Let me explain. For most of the period between the 16th and 20th centuries, a particular style of theology dominated the discourse between the churches. This style placed a great deal of emphasis on precise definition of doctrinal positions. The revelation of Jesus, transmitted to us through scripture and interpreted by tradition, came to be expressed doctrinally in responses to various heresies, which required a clarity of teaching. 
That clarity resulted in the creeds, the conciliar teaching, and later the dogmatic definitions. With the Protestant Reformation, the need to give a complete account of the faith led to the writing of various confessions, which were publicly subscribed to by the reformers. The confessional approach divided doctrine into two categories, status confessionis and ideophora, the latter being a matter of indifference and the former being something you were prepared to go to war over, sadly, sometimes literally. But underneath the distinction between an organic development of doctrine within a tradition and confessions of faith lay a more subtle but yet more important distinction. Catholics and Lutherans developed distinct thought forms, to use one of Avery Dulles' expressions. These distinct thought forms represent different theological methodologies, which are necessary to understand if we are to approach a reconciliation at the level of doctrinal propositions. Dulles claimed that the Catholic thought form, as expressed in the documents of the Council of Trent, is, quote, scholastic and heavily indebted to Greek metaphysics, close quote. Such a scholastic method, Dulles notes, adopts a contemplative point of view, seeking explanation. The Lutheran thought form, according to Dulles, is more existential, personalistic, or some prefer to say relational. Dulles notes that Luther and his followers adopted a confessional posture and seek to address God and give an account of themselves before God. Dulles's point is that each framework casts a distinct and different hue on the terms used in theology. I previously argued that the differences in theological method often reveal a dis the distinctive insights of a particular Christian tradition. It's precisely where you study the differences that you're able to find the unique insights that animate the particularity of a given tradition. Now, not to deal with the differences in theological method is to turn our doctrinal statements into heuristics, mental shortcuts, or unconscious routines to cope with complexity. I would argue that only by dealing with the complexity of method and the complexity of nomenclature can we adequately avoid a polemical stance and maintain true dialogue. This, in the end, has been the genius of the bilateral dialogues of the 20th and early 21st century. Dulles summarizes the principles around ecumenical method which allow this approach as follows, and I'm going to share with you a somewhat extended quote here. He writes, Vatican II, which is normative, lays down the basic principles. It states that the separated churches can acknowledge each other as truly Christian and being in a state of real though imperfect communion. Dialogue between experts from different churches and ecclesial communities should not be undertaken with, excuse me, should be undertaken with a view to restoring full communion. The deposit of faith has been handed down in different ways, in different places and cultures. The deposit of faith is one thing, and the theological formulations quite another. Varying theological formulations must often be considered complementary rather than conflicting. It's, it is hardly surprising then that if sometimes one tradition comes nearer than another to an apt appreciation of certain aspects of a revealed mystery and has expressed them more lucidly. Dr. Jungi correctly notes that we need to overcome a methodological shortcoming in the ecumenical movement that tends to think that with the publication of a report, realities have already been substantially transformed. He calls for a clear process of reception to be designed. 
This is an echo of something Michael Kinnaman said in 1985, where he commented on the problem of reception of ecumenical agreements by churches, saying, the remarkable theological work of recent years signals a new moment of decision for the ecumenical movement. I suspect that the next decade will be ecumenically difficult as a result. Many of our churches have such uncertainty about their teaching authority and decision-making processes that they don't know how to receive ecumenical documents. Actually, the, theologic, the theoretical work behind this, I would argue, has already been done. My own dissertation director, Father Frederick Bliss, made the important point, which supports Dr. Jung's argument, that reception is not solely the work of experts. Actually, it's a task of the whole church. That task is not to have the faithful study reports. Rather, it is to increase the koinonia between them. It involves the ecumenical patience to realize that we cannot declare full communion and just move on. This, in a sense, was the essence of my criticism of the concordative of agreement between the Episcopal Church and the ELCA. Churches which are separated declare full communion and then continue to live essentially separate existences without having realized an actual koinonia. I proposed instead that between the resolution of a theological obstacle to unity and the entrance into full altar and pulpit fellowship, there should be a separate stage of reflection where each church included the other in its ordinary decision making. In other words, and I coined a word for this, intergovernance needed to proceed intercommunion. Using Dulles' insight about the different thought forms, we need the ecumenical patience to include each other in our church's inner life. In doing so, we will benefit from the distinctive insights each ecclesial thought form offers to the difficult questions we all face. In doing so, we would also answer the ecumenical impatience by introducing the ecumenical dimension into the ordinary life of each church. The development of theological method I described was affirmed by Pope St. John Paul II in his encyclical letter, Utunum Sint. I'd be bold to argue that it is the greatest breakthrough of the ecumenical movement and the condition of the possibility of the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification, it being this development of theological method. As Dulles says towards the end of his lecture, it's necessary to establish that Lutheran proclamation and Catholic speculation are both legitimate derivatives of the same gospel and therefore compatible. So allow me to end with my own provocation. Why not move further in ecumenical dialogues by allowing our ecumenical partners to have voice in our internal deliberations of life in our churches? Pope John Paul II wrote, the increase of fellowship in a reform which is continuous and carried out in the light of the apostolic tradition is certainly, in the present circumstances of Christians, one of the most distinctive and important aspects of ecumenism. Moreover, it's an essential guarantee of its future. The faithful of the Catholic Church cannot forget that the ecumenical thrust of the Second Vatican Council is one consequence of all that the Church at that time committed herself to doing in order to re-examine herself in the light of the gospel and the great tradition. My predecessor, Pope John XXIII, understood this clearly. In calling the council, 
he refused to separate renewal from ecumenical openness. Listening to each other with the belief that both Lutheran proclamation and Catholic speculation are both legitimate thought forms is a hermeneutic which would foster appreciation of diverse understanding of aspects of a revealed mystery, allowing us to receive the mystery more deeply. Ultimately, the ecumenical endeavor is one of conversion. We must be bold to commit ourselves, individually and as churches, to allow the Holy Spirit, given to us in baptism, to convert us to the fullness of the revealed mystery of Christ, some aspects of which may find more lucid expression in the witness of our brothers and sisters in other communions. And so let us pray, come Holy Spirit.